Hey everyone, welcome to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. In the Mobile User Acquisition Show, we feature interviews with the smartest folks in mobile and growth who share invaluable, actionable, tactical insights on every aspect of mobile growth and marketing, not to mention some adjacent areas just as well. The Mobile User Acquisition Show is presented by me, Shaman Rao, CEO of the mobile growth marketing firm Rocketship HQ, and produced by Karishma Sundaram, our superstar content marketing manager at Rocketship HQ. Each episode includes strategies, tips, and pointers from the leading edge of mobile growth marketing that you can use to unlock tremendous growth for your app in a sustainable and capital efficient manner. Our guest today is Janie Perissini, Senior Director of Mobile Marketing and Growth at Electronic Arts. Prior to this, Janie held leadership roles at DraftKings, Machine Zone, and Reddit, among other companies. Janie has managed growth for mobile apps at the kind of scale that very, very few others we know have. In today's conversation, she brings a perspective that is at once wide-ranging and long-term focused. She describes how she thinks about future-proofing and risk-proofing growth in a post-identifier world by embracing strategies that can let developers own their own bidding and media buying decisioning. While the status quo thus far has been to let the platforms handle key bidding and targeting decisions, Janie explains why a SCAD network could be much, much less effective when it comes to letting platforms do your bidding for you. Janie talks about a new approach to both take control of the destiny of an app's growth as well as to insulate oneself, oneself from shocks such as Apple's recent privacy policy changes. This is a truly insightful conversation that illustrates a truly long-term perspective on growth and I'm thrilled to have Janie on this show today. I am very excited to welcome Janie Perissini to the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Janie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Janie, let's jump in. I've been looking forward to having you on this show because you've had some very strong opinions and also you've had a lot of clarity of thinking around how to approach what's going to happen in terms of the deprecation of the IDFA. So you have a very unique perspective and we're going to talk about how you're thinking about potentially just sidestepping SCAD network. And I'm excited to dive into all of that just because that's something a lot of people take for granted and assume that that's the only path. So Janie, your team manages multiple titles and at least a part of your approach involves completely bypassing SCAD network. Tell us about this approach where you're contemplating bypassing SCAD network. And also tell us what inspired this particular approach. Sure. So I wouldn't say bypassing SK at network. I would say future proofing protocols, future proofing our strategy for multiple protocols. So my concern is this could become a, a little bit of a, a nightmare for advertisers to manage if other app stores or inventory sources go that way, in which case then as an advertiser, it becomes a question of, is the juice worth the squeeze to even leverage the protocols? If there's multiple, even as we're looking today on our side, on the demand side or advertiser side, we're only seeing a fraction of scan compliant inventory. So if we're only seeing 13, 15% what's next year going to look like? What's the following year going to look like? When is going to be the majority of our, of the inventory that we're actually buying scan compliant? Will it ever be the majority? And I think if we think about it from that approach, then practically, should we be overly concerned about conversion values and campaign ID numbers? Or should we be thinking about what if we brought the you know decision engine in, in-house? What if we didn't have to share data with the likes of Facebook or others to create lookalike audiences and to be reliant on their algorithms. What if we could do that internally, which is, it's not impossible, but it does change the landscape of a marketing team internally from 
relying on others to do a lot of the algorithmic work and bringing that in-house. That does take technical capabilities, that takes data science, that takes additional servers and, and, and the like, but it makes sense for companies that spend a lot. I mean, you look at Zynga that just acquired Chartroost. You know, when I was at Machine Zone, we had a, a DSP in, in-house. It, it used to be, it, when, when, aver, when advertisers floated with this idea, because it's not a novel idea to, oh, we should bidder as a service. You know, there's plenty of vendors out there that do bidder as a service. But it used to be that in comparison of your performance with the likes of Facebook, it never, it never really panned out. It was always second or third tier compared to Facebook or Google performance. But with the impact of the deprecation of IDFA, everyone's CPIs are going up. I don't, I don't know any person I've talked to to date that hasn't been impacted with their campaigns. But that's not really the, my concern in the trend right now. The trends I'm seeing that are more concerning are the fact that the Facebook and, and partners that we used to rely heavily on acquiring high value users, they don't have that data anymore and they're not driving as high value of users. So that would be more of my focus as an advertiser is bringing the decision engine in-house to acquire high value users where those cohorts after the deprecation of IDFA have gotten smaller and smaller, have contributed less revenue over time. And that's more of a concern, right? In free-to-play space, your high-value yeah. users, your higher cohorts end up contributing the majority of the lion's share of your revenue. So, Yeah, I like how you characterize this. The fact that there are very different protocols on different platforms, that's a reality that's easy to lose sight of when the loudest voices just speak of the IDFA. Mm -hmm. Whereas even if IDFA deprecation is 100% complete, all of Android would not get coverage under that. Right? Yes. Not to mention, you know, if there's another Android app store or if it's... Yeah, you have Unity and you have all these others. And I think that's a very important characterization. I think that makes so much sense. Right? And would you say under this paradigm, would you suggest that... Would you be looking to rely on SKAD network for iOS traffic? Or would you supplement the workings of your decision engine that you spoke of, which I'm sure we'll dive into in more detail. So would you combine IS optimization with SCAD network plus the decision engine? How would that yeah. look like? There's no doubt that we're still driving towards being, you know, and we are compliant with SCAN and we are buying SCAN and we are focused on partnering with our partners to get them compliant with SCAN. But it's a fraction of overall inventory and I can't help but think as we look, you know, as, as any gaming company will look at, let's say emerging markets, Asia, where iOS isn't the majority, it's not even, you know, it's a sliver of, of the total. Where's the point of diminishing returns in terms of being yeah. overly uh, compliant and also building tooling or, you know, automation and all of the tools that a lot of gaming companies or larger advertisers have built over time that we're relying on IDFA, they've had to reverse engineer all of those toolings and all of those automated tools. And it probably is very painful for them, but to yeah. do that over and over again, if multiple app stores do yeah. the same thing, if multiple, you know, I, I see this as a, as a disruption to business, just as much as like, yeah. you know, ab absolutely want to be privacy compliant, but I think that there's you know, you, it doesn't take much to Google or to search the news right now in terms of Apple's decision to hire, you know, a pretty notorious ad tech person to lead their ad platform for a short period of time. So it makes me wonder what, what are the motives I think of moving towards scan and, you know, user privacy should be taken seriously. It should not be used as a pawn to one up another business partner in my perspective. That's not yeah. how we should be do, doing business. We should, yeah. if we're yeah. you know, focused on user privacy, we focus on user privacy, but it's not a pawn or a bargaining chip in, yeah. in the market. Yeah, 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 certainly, right. And if we look at everything that Apple is doing, it's very, very clear that privacy is a facade for a strategic decision to move into advertising. And that you pointed out from the recent 
hiring decision, certainly that makes sense. And what I'm also hearing you say is, look, as a marketer, not relying completely on the protocol that is uh, proposed by Apple is a way of, as you said, future-proofing the upsell. Yeah, I don't think 100% relying on that protocol or that being the backbone of your business from a UA perspective is strategic in the long term. Certainly, certainly, certainly. And you spoke of building a decision engine, which you, which it's my understanding is going to be your strategic focus to make sure there isn't as much reliance on a SCAD network. Tell us more about what this looks like. What what is it? What what is the decision engine? What does that look like? Sure. Again, this I'm not. You know, this is not novel. This is, you know, I'm not the smartest one in the room. But so others have have gone this route too. Some have been successful. Some you know it, have not. And most decision engines start with. Typically, it's very simple in terms of. They either white label a bidder as a service in terms of getting access to programmatic channels, or they, you know, develop on top of APIs to buy programmatically. The engine itself can go a few ways, similar to like how lifecycle marketing kind of has gone into these phases. The crawl, walk, run approach is you start with what, what you would consider linear optimization. Every day you look at you know, your inventory uh, coming in and you cut the bottom 10% or basically the most inefficient sources that your campaigns are running on and you continue on. Then you get more sophisticated where you actually start doing bid modifications. So depending on the characteristics of bid calls in the inventory that you're looking at, you can, you know, go up, go down on your bigs. If it's a high-end device, if it's, you know, that you there's something about that call that you consider an indicator of a, you know, high value or just even a high propensity to convert a uh, player, then you use uh, bid modifiers. And then after that, then you get into actually sophisticated algorithmic decisioning. So that kind of crawl, walk, run approach is typically how it goes, where you start with linear optimization, doesn't take a lot of, you know, tech or anything like that. Usually it's in Excel. Oh. And then you go to bid yeah. modification, which, which, which again can be in G sheets in Excel to some degree, and you house it somewhere like an S3 bucket or something. And then you go to full blown building algorithms on top of these bidder as a service, or if you partner with a DSP that can allow, bring your own algorithms that can also yeah. be, you know, something you can do. Yeah. 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 So certainly. Right. So from what you're saying, this could become a more sophisticated version of something you could basically execute with spreadsheets. And what you're also saying is, look, there are contextual variables that could be very powerful in yeah. determining what could be valuable users. And would a lot would not a lot of this be applicable primarily in programmatic, or would you say that some of this could also be applicable, let's just say, on owned and operated inventory? Oh yeah. So, so absolutely. I mean, you, you know, you look at the acquisition of Zynga and Sharp, but Zynga has a massive player network. So one can't, you know, you can assume, I would assume that they are going to be way more sophisticated in upselling and cross-selling across their own network with the acquisition of charge boost. I mean, it's now a race to, for larger gaming companies that have a pretty diverse portfolio and, you know, and a sizable audience to think that way of how to better manage your own players rather than just being a hundred percent reliant on only acquiring new players. But if you're, you know, and it, it kind of is a shift, it's the evolution of where we've come from UA and growth in terms of it started with pretty basic, you know, hit a certain install and, you know, that's about it to ROAS and backend, you know, and, and deeper metrics to revenue velocity and all these things. And, and then now it's, well, it's actually quite expensive too, to retain users. So what are we doing to retain and also grow those retained users, you know, as a contribution of our overall revenue. And I think that's what we're going to see too, is the the deprecation of idea phase of forcing function for a lot of gaming companies to become more sophisticated in life cycle. And one of those aspects is bringing a decision engine in-house to help with promos, offers, where to send users, 
and, and manage it in a way more sophisticated manner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And would it be accurate to say that for platforms like, let's just say Facebook or Snap, that rely on SCAD network for optimization, you know, if you're saying cost per add to cart or cost per purchase, that would still lean on SCAD network or is that not quite the case? You know, I, I can't tell you exactly, you know, what's going on internally at Facebook in terms of what their plans are, but I can't, you know, mo majority, let's say 40 to 50% of most UA's budget goes to, to Facebook. I mean, and that's pretty consistent no matter who you talk to. It's, it's not because, you know, we all love Instagram and things like that. It's because it performs. And uh, similar on the monetization side, people have fan implemented as a publisher on the monetization side because it performs. It, it drives high CPMs. Well, on the advertiser side, we get higher value users when we, when we leverage Facebook. And if lookalike audience is not performing on Facebook, we got kind of a problem because that's, yeah. you're talking about half of your, your budget going to one partner and the lion's share of that budget that is going to that partner going to modeling for lookalikes. So yeah. you're going to have to, as an advertiser, that might be something you're going to have to do yourself if yeah. Facebook doesn't have that data anymore. So a couple of years ago, you know, as you also mentioned, JD, number of folks tried to in-house programmatic and it just wasn't very successful at the time. What are some of the key factors that would contribute to this having a better shot at success going forward? I think it's really just a comparison of performance. I mean, programmatic, a lot of people quote unquote failed, not because it wasn't working you know, kind of overall, but it wasn't as efficient in comparison to channels like Facebook. But if you have channels that aren't accessing as much data, you can't leverage, you can't send your own first party data as, as, as much as you did. The comparison and the performance is now becoming more, I wouldn't know, I, I wouldn't say at parity yet, but the gap between the performance of programmatic versus the performance of, you know, some, something like a Facebook that gap is closing. And then it becomes way more interesting to be like, hmm, well, it's not like now we have to make a big leap to impact performance as much as we just have to do incremental steps to get to a place where sure. we can use it to scale. Sure, sure. And for a company that's exploring building a decision engine of this sort, what are typically good starting points? Are there off the shelf solutions? Or would it be a sort of spreadsheet based modeling that you described? What sort of resourcing should they plan for? What do you think that should, would be good starting points for somebody that's looking to go down this path? Yeah, I think the first thing is get super close with whatever DSP you're currently working with. Ask them first, do you, do you all allow bring your own algorithms? A lot of mobile specific DSPs don't. And I can't tell you why, because programmatic inherently is supposed to not be black box, but here we are. And if, but if in the off chance that your mobile DSP or a DSP that you're, you're working with does allow for bring your own algorithms or is open to it, I would heavily rely on them to help partner and kind of consult for, for, for your internal team on how to, how to develop your own algorithms. If you aren't currently working with a DSP, you can look at Bitter as a service. It does behoove you though to leverage a consultant or someone that has ad tech and programmatic experience because it's not, it's, it's, it's tech still, it's sophisticated tech and it's not just, you know, a typical UA buyer that can manage this him or herself or their self. This requires coordination on the data science side, on the, on your infrastructure, on the media side. So it's, it's a beast. This is, you know, this is, this is, this is development work. This is mathematics. This is buying. So I would say start with, if you're working already with the DSP, start to engage with them, not just as an inventory source in terms of, you know, throwing budget at them, but you know, Hey, can you walk us through a little bit more on how your algorithms work? And if they're not open to that, I start asking why they aren't open to showing their algorithms. Most should be able to give a white paper, at least of how their algorithms work. And if they aren't willing, then you should be very concerned about why you're working with them. And then also, yeah, do you allow bidder as a cert or do you allow bring your own algorithm? Yes, no. And then kind of go down that route. Okay. Well, you know, then we're going to start looking for a DSP that will, and we're going to partner with them. So. Sure. 
and when you say bring your own algorithm, you're basically saying you being able to build, being able to use anything, bid modifiers. Hey, do you allow bid modifiers? Can we upload our own bid modification sheets? Hey, do you allow uh, us to host our own algorithms and then just leverage your your tech essentially to access inventory? I mean, bring right. your own algorithms. Yes, is a, a kind of a umbrella term I would say for just yeah. proprietary decisioning that the advertiser can bring to to a DSP. Yeah. Sure. And that decisioning would involve contextual variables like you described yep. earlier. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it too is taking an inventory, like what apps drive the majority of your traffic even and, and, and going even down the route of like, can we access them programmatically? What kind of apps are like those that we can create? You know, yes, some bid modifi modifications for, there's a lot of uses like for programmatic in general it's not, it's also not just RTB, you know, programmatic can, can, it just negates the, the need really to engage with, it, with people over email as well. So. And at what level of scale would it make sense for a developer to start exploring some of these solutions? Because it certainly, as you said, is very development intensive, very engineering intensive to be able to, or data science intensive. Yeah. Right? What level of scale would it make sense for somebody to look at this? I would say over over about fifty to seventy million dollars annual spend is something that it would it would make sense. It would at least make sense to 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 flirt with anything over a hundred million. You should absolutely be be doing that. Certainly, certainly, and at that level of scale, just you know, I, I imagine you're paying significant amounts to the DSPs and the intermediaries at that point of time, so the savings can some fairly easily be justified at that level of spending and scale, yes. I would imagine. Right? Well, yeah, and we're only even talking, you know, I was just only explaining the efficiencies on the, but like there's there's middleman fees, right? The fee that, the cut that a DSP, you know, that an SSP has with the DSP in the exchange. So, you know, if you add up all of the, all of the, you know, you know, SPO supply path optimization. So if you basically, take inventory of all of the cuts along the path of how that one media dollar that you're intending to spend on inventory gets shared. And then at the end result, how much of that actual original dollar uh, is spent on media and you try to rake that back, you know, that too can, it should be factored into the efficiencies that you're gaining with, you know, a decision engine. Certainly, certainly. And not to mention, as you said, the optimization is so much stronger, so much more powerful than you own it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Wonderful, Janie. This is certainly a lot of food for thought, certainly a very unique and interesting perspective. And as you pointed out, this may not have worked very well a couple of years ago, just because the proprietary algorithms of platforms were so strong. But perhaps, you know, this is a time when the sort of strategy of owning your own decisioning can work. Certainly, this has been very, very instructive. And this is perhaps a good place for us to start to wrap, Janie. But yeah, any closing thoughts, any other things folks should keep in mind as they think through their way forward? Yeah, um, it's, I would say don't give up on it. <laughs> Decision engines are hard. It is more than a quarter endeavor or a two quarter endeavor. This takes over typically a fiscal year, if not more to, to get a V1 going. And. I would also, you know, take a hard look too at don't, don't just think about scan in the context of iOS, but think about all of the protocols that you think you might be engaging with in the next two to three years and where that point of diminishing returns is in terms of how focused you want to be on overly optimizing conversion values on one protocol when if there's three or four coming down the pike as well. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah, and as you said, this lets you plan not just for SCAD, not just for I, idea phase effective deprecation, but for your longer term future. 100%, yeah. You're future proofing yourself, as you said. Janie, thank you so much for being on the Mobile User Acquisition Show. Before we wrap, can you tell folks how you, they can find out more about you and everything you do? Of course. I'm very present on LinkedIn, so you can always set up time with me on my calendar links. I'm an open book, so reach out to me. I'm at Janie for Twitter and 
you know, if, if you want to get a hold of me, I'm sure you'll be able to. I'm very SEO friendly as well. So would Wonderful. love to hear from, from anyone. Wonderful. And we will certainly link to your socials from the show notes for, for folks to find you just there as well. Wonderful, Janie. Thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you. For more tips, pointers, and strategies from the leading edge of mobile user acquisition, subscribe to our YouTube channel right here or check out our blog, rocketshiphq.com slash blog.